So, uh, last time I left you at uh, the solution of uh, fully developed heat transfer uh, through a pipe and I asked you to uh, know, work out the remaining part of the solution because I left it up to a point when I had developed the equation for temperature and I wanted you to apply the boundary condition, solve the temperature, find out uh, the temperature profile and then find out uh, the resultant Nusselt's number. And I give this to a home, you know, as a home assignment. So, I guess all of you have done it uh, now. So, I think uh, in that case I will just explain the problem a little bit further before I go into radiation. And I will also pose the same problem to you. Uh, instead of flow through a circular pipe, it is going to be a fully developed flow between two parallel plates. And that solution without fail you must work out. Okay? Otherwise, you will not have any exposure to solving of the differential equations. Uh, these are very important for us because you know in, the, in your undergraduate curriculum beyond the second year level you really do not get to do much of maths. So, you got to improve your analytical skill if you want to do uh, you know quantitative research. So, I guess it is important for you to work out the implications of the differential equation. So, I will demonstrate the procedure you know and uh, uh, more or less give you the outline the solution and so on and so forth. So, where I was, uh, I was so as I will write the equations and I will keep on leveling this diagram. So, this is the radial direction and this is the actual direction. Fully developed flow and heat transfer and if you remember the uh, non dimensional uh, no the this is uh, what i derived uh, into 4 q w and then this is uh, this is uh, q w and d are zero this is k. Okay, let me just write down this. So, from z, okay, this. And then if you remember, I wrote this, this is the definition and here what I did is basically I have shown that this is equal to uh, 2 times Q w which is the wall heat flux and then we had here uh, rho C p V z average uh, times there was 2 pi r 0 here and pi r square here and this is. And if you substitute this, then the expression was this, the final expression. So, rho this is this cancels out. So, we have uh, 1 minus r square by r square into 2 times q w divided by <coughs> and if you bring this r, then we get k over r 0 or we can write down as 4 times this to be taken as d, where this is d and this is r 0. Okay? And that is, is equal to 1 by r. Now, I will write down. So, that becomes the governing equation. So, up to this point, I actually did in the last class. And then I asked you to find out, integrate this equation. The wall heat flux is constant. K is the thermal conductivity, D is the diameter. And this equation, of course, if you solve it by applying, uh, you know, uh, if you non-dimensionalize this equation, then it becomes more convenient to work out. And the non-dimensional 
uh, parameter is defined like Tw minus T and then we have Q wall into parameter divided by K. So, if we look at Fourier's equation, Fourier's equation is wall heat flux or flux is equal to thermal conductivity multiplied by <coughs> temperature divided by length scale. So, d by k into q. So, this is the length scale which has come with q and this is the thermal conductivity which has been put in the denominator. So, the net quantity of this is according to Fourier's law has a dimension of temperature. So, this is also temperature, this is also temperature. So, therefore, theta is a non-dimensional temperature and if you do it eta is equal to r by r. Then you can non-dimensionalize this equation very nicely and this equation will non-dimensionalize, it will have this particular form 1 minus eta square, okay. this is equal to minus <coughs> 1 by eta and this is uh, that becomes the equation. So, you can substitute these parameters into this equation and then you can show that well from here by non-dimensionalization you can conveniently get to this equation. Now, the boundary conditions are when eta is equal to 0, okay. obviously the flux is equal to 0, there is a symmetry around the theta direction. So, and when eta is equal to 1, so eta is equal to 0 is central line actually r is equal to 0 and eta is equal to 1 is actually the wall and at wall T w is equal T is equal to T w. So, theta becomes is equal to 0. The boundary conditions have become very simple because now you know everything varies between 0 and 1. So, you will get after you integrate this term get an expression uh, where you will see that theta comes out to be in the form of uh, <coughs> a number. Okay. So, now you can integrate this equation and you can find out that what is theta and that theta will come out to be in terms of eta. So, this is straightforward solution, there is not much tricks involved, it is a straightforward one integration, second integration, then applying the boundary condition and this will come out to be eta square by 4 I will put a minus sign here minus theta to the power 4 by 16 minus 3 by 16. That is what is going to be the solution of this equation. And now it becomes very simple. What is my theta? The theta is T w minus T divided by Q w into diameter divided by the thermal conductivity and that is equal to minus <coughs> 3 by 16 that is. So, therefore, I can get T w minus T is equal to minus Q w d by k into Once you get this expression, you can now find out that what is T w minus T b because you, uh, you know the definition of bulk temperature. So, that will require some integration and you will see that this will come out to be Q w by d okay. and if you do this integration and uh, this integration is to be done between the limit because uh, the denominator will be is equal to 1. So, we have you have to multiply this because this is temperature. So, to get it into the heat term, okay, so what you are going to do? You are going to do multiply this with mass flow rate or m dot C p. Then m dot C p delta t will be the net heat divided by the m dot C p over the cross sectional area okay, and then you should get. So, if you straightforward integrate this across the cross section 0 to 1, the denominator will not come here and then you can do this integral and that becomes so 
that is what it is. And you must understand that how did I get this? I got this by invoking the definition of the bulk temperature which requires you know finding out that what is the across the cross sectional area. So, if you remember if I, I have drawn something like this yesterday okay, and there it varies from r is equal to 0 to 1, it is over this cross sectional area that you have to find out the bulk temperature. So, it necessitates an integration from r is equal to 0 to r is equal to 1 and the denominator of course, when you will integrate this then what happens is 0 to 1 integral d n will become 1. So, that is what I have not written. So, this becomes the expression straight forward and if you remember now that what I have defined, I have defined that h times T w minus T b is equal to my Q w that is the flux definition and also the Nusselt's number is equal to h divided by <coughs> thermal conductivity of the fluid which I am writing as k and this is equal to d. So, therefore, <coughs> if you do this then you will find out this turns out to be substitute the value this becomes is equal to q w d and there is a sorry q w d by k okay q w d by k. So, q w d by k d by k into I think 14 by 20 that is the value because all will be known in terms of 0 and 1. So, you will get a numerical value here. And if you look at this, from this you find out that T w minus T b by Q w is, is equal to h. So, therefore, T w minus T b by Q w multiplied by d by k will become my Nusselt's number. So, I have obtained T w by minus T b, I will divide it by Q w. So, I will be left with d here, but Q w T w by T b divided by Q w is nothing but my h. So, h times okay, uh, we will get it here. So, Q w. So, this is h inverse actually. So, we will get it h d by k and that h d by k actually is <coughs> T w by T b is equal to h and then I will multiply this by, uh, no this is h 1. Okay. So, let me just erase it here better. Okay. So, we have h is equal to, I wrote it other way, let me not put it T w minus T b. So, therefore, h d by k which is, is equal to Nusselt's number diameter is is equal to d by k into q w by t w minus t b. So, I got it almost in the same form as you can see here. So, I will transpose this. So, I got the same number h t w minus t b will come here and d by k is there already. So, q by q w by this. So, the inverse of this number is going to be the Nusselt's number and then therefore, the Nusselt's number diameter will come out to be from this 20 by 40, <coughs> roughly 1.4 approximately. <coughs> I have done the solution for you practically except for this class 10 level integration that you have this equation, this expression and then from there you find out that what is equal to theta and then this step you will do the integration and then find out that this is the net result of the integration. So, this is after integrating you obtain. So, here again, so this is step 1 I would do, I would like to work you out which is 10th level maths and this is also from here to here is step 1. So, step 1 and a step 2 if you go back and if you just 
you know, scribble it through your notes and do it on the left, you will be able to find out how I have derived this and this becomes a, this is I think 95 percent of the solution I have given. Uh, now, the same problem I would like you when you go back because you have not done it in, you know, I wanted you to do this. So, you can consider flow between two infinitely long parallel plate separated by distance of 2 L. So, there is a line of symmetry and we have this is 2 L is the distance of separation between the plate okay? and then Q W is the you have to mechanically you can mechanically also do just by following the same procedure except for that this geometry now the governing equation will be not 1 by r or something it is a Cartesian coordinate governing equation we will start with. Okay? You still will get a parabolic velocity profile because these are all stationary plates here flow between parallel plates. So, you can use you know uh, mechanically the formulation that the solution that I have given and find out that in this particular case what is the Nusselt's number. Okay, that you should be able to calculate as I have calculated in this particular case that is equal to 1.4. So, you should be able to derive find out what is Nusselt's number. So, fully developed flow and heat transfer between two parallel plates separated by distance of 2L. Please do this exercise when you go back so that you get familiarized with the you know solving of these equations because otherwise you will not be able to really tackle uh, or solve problems uh, during examinations or in the tutorials. So, I think I will not discuss any further convective uh, heat transfer uh, and except perhaps saying that uh, you know in many of the industrial scenario uh, we are concerned with finding uh, the melt uh, uh, characteristics in terms of the melt temperature in terms of reactions in the melt or reactions in a, in a fluid. So, uh, basically the exchanges are important between solid and liquid or between gas and liquid, but within the bulk liquid itself many times will be it will be necessary for us to calculate the temperature field because that will tell us uh, you know uh, uh, whether uh, the processing is going on correctly or not. For example, I can say that uh, because all of you are metallurgists I can give you that example. You can imagine that in the continuous casting uh, uh, bay uh, we require a molten metal with a super heat plus minus 10 degree centigrade. Now, uh, so that the several stations we monitor temperature and make sure uh, that uh, you know by the time the metal uh, is transferred to the continuous casting bay the desired uh, super heat within plus minus 10 degree is achieved. Super heat means it is the excess temperature above the melting point of steel. Now, we, there are many you have to transfer the ladle or the vessel from one place to another place. There are chemical reactions etcetera going on. So, you have to really do thermal balance calculations at many stages in order to see how heat is generated, how heat is lost and what is the evolution of temperature in the melt as a function of time. So, that with certainty you can predict that yes, if I do, if I you know do this processing for 10 minutes, then spend 5 minutes of time in transporting the vessel then there is a good possibility that I will be able to reach the correct temperature or deliver the correct temp metal with the correct temperature in the continuous casting machine. So, this necessitates that the evolution of temperature within the melt is known at various stages as a function of time and this necessitates that not merely calculation of Nusselt's number will suffice in those cases what happened is we have to really consider the Navier-Stokes equation and the temperature you know energy balance equation solve them together to find out the melt distribution and we have to solve these equations in a transient mode because we are talking about evolution of temperature as a function of time. So, elaborate solutions will be necessary and that elaboration solutions will help us to map the temperature of steel melt or aluminum melt or zinc liquid zinc as a function of time as you know uh, the metal is sitting. Uh, in a container vessel during transportation just before solidification. So, we have to there are two methodologies. So, in some cases we will solve the differential equations extract the temperature field. In certain cases when the temperature field elaborate calculation of temperature field is not necessary this kind of a procedure which I have just now outlined may suffice and we should be able to calculate the rate of the processes uh, you know very conveniently. <coughs> Yeah.
in actual industrial scales, uh, this, uh, you know, finding out the evolution of melt temperature is a quite complex task. It is not so simple because you cannot do it just like the way I have take, you know, taken a simple equation, solved it on the blackboard. You cannot do it. So, you have to have a computational method. You have to solve 8, 10 simultaneous partial differential equations which are interlinked, which are non-homogeneous. You have free convection, force convection both. You have turbulence phenomena because most of the metal processing reactors are large. Uh, it is in they are inherently turbulent. So, and also many a times we see that there are not only just metal, there is slag sitting in the vessel, there are gases being injected into the metal, okay. The gases may be inert when you inject argon into the molten steel or any other metal or the gas could be reactive particularly when you inject oxygen through aluminum or chlorine through aluminum and oxygen through iron, okay. So, diverse physical phenomena are going to be involved. So, it is not as simple a task. It is really a frontier of the subject when we are talking about, um, you know, uh, a chemically reacting multiphase flows. That is what is basically the metal processing uh, flows are or liquid metal processing flows are and that necessitates uh, quite a bit of knowledge on the theory of fluid flow, heat transfer, turbulence, numerical methods and so on and so forth. So, we are not going to discuss all these things, but I thought that I will just mention uh, this to you before I proceed to the last uh, topic uh, in the section, uh, not last topic, uh, last but one because once we talk about radiation, then we will move, go back and then outline that how, to what extent the conduction, convection and radiation theories are applicable to metals processing. So, some examples. Uh, industrial example relevance of the subject will be explained through some case studies. But for the time being, let us I think concentrate on <coughs> radiation or radiative transfer. The rate law of radiation, uh, radiation is very important uh, process and uh, it will be at once evident to you the moment I write the uh, rate expression for uh, radiant energy. The radiant energy uh, is <coughs> uh, proportional to absolute temperature raised to the power 4. So, And if we say that we want to, the proportionality constant is the Stephens Boltzmann constant. Theta is temperature, it is not in centigrade scale, it is in absolute scale, Kelvin, not degree Kelvin, but Kelvin, okay. And this is the Stephen Boltzmann constant, which has a value of. Kelvin to the power 4. So, this Kelvin to the power 4, this Kelvin to the power 4 will cancel out. So, therefore, the moment you multiply sigma with theta to the power 4, what we are going to get is the radiant energy and that radiant energy is basically the radiation flux. A net radiation energy which is in joules per second or watt per second is therefore is equal to. in which A represents the area of the substance material. So, what does this indicate? This indicate this tells us that if you have an object uh, solid object and its temperature is theta and it is emitting radiation uh, you know as per this particular law. So, the flux is sigma into theta to the power 4 which essentially tells us that uh, the radiant energy becomes a very important parameter when temperature is high. If temperature is low in that case radiation is you know in inconsequential. But for high temperature, 
the radiation becomes a dominant mechanism of heat transfer. Of course, there has to be a temperature gradient, but uh, when you have a temperature gradient, then heat transfer takes place. But when you have the temperature, uh, you know, very high, in that case, the radiation uh, assumes uh, a very significant value. We have seen that we have you know, a con conduction flux, we have a convection flux, these are expressions that we have seen and uh, we have now uh, the radiation flux which is theta s to the power 4, theta s is equal to absolute temperature plus 273. Now, Radiation as you all know does not require a material medium unlike conduction and convection. Uh, radiative transport does not require a material medium and that is how we get heat from the sun. So, you can imagine it is so far away, but that the surface temperature of sun is very, very large. So, therefore, uh, the radiant energy coming out of sun is extremely, it is a million degree centigrade maybe. So, you can imagine you know if it is million degree centigrade then what should be raised to the power 4. So, it is an enormous uh, value and the radiation you know suppose in winter days if you it is a sunny day you sit inside a car you do not have to put on the heater if you close down all the windows okay, within 10 minutes of time uh, the car ambience becomes really warm. It is because the solar heat is entering into the car is being trapped and that you are getting heated is because of the radiation mechanism itself. In metals therefore, metals are high temperature processing operations. When we talk of we have mineral bracing and then once we finish mineral bracing and then the extraction metallurgy starts and extraction metallurgy particularly the pyro and electrometallurgical operations are high temperature operations and therefore, in high temperature operations we will expect that the radiation is going to be a very dominant mechanism. Now, radiation uh, this basically uh, you know, it's it's an exchange mechanism. Okay, it, it transports between you know two objects or two surfaces, but essentially, just like conduction and convection, it's a transport mechanism. And this has great significance. For example, if you go, I will give you some examples from say steel making. Uh, you you may have heard about reheat furnaces. you have heard of soaking pits. Continuous casting and subsequent cooling, cooling of slabs. Because let me give you a flavor, we know that most of the time uh, when we finish casting, we, re, we further work on the solidified piece. That means, if you produce bullet, if you produce blooms or if you produce slabs through continuous casting or ingot casting processes, okay, big ingots, in that case these are not supplied to the customer as it is, they are uh, mechanical working is done on them and that mechanical working is done at elevated temperature because we want to do hot working above the recrystallization temperature. What is steel's recrystallization temperature? Close to 1000 degree centigrade. So, therefore, this theta is equal to 1273 approximately. So, you can imagine 1273 raised to the power 4. Of course, this has a value as I have indicated 5.6 into 10 to the power minus 8. Still, if you have 1000 degree or 1000 Kelvin, then you can imagine this is going to be 10 to the power 12, 3, three zeros and 4. So, therefore, the net could be 10 to the power minus 8 multiplied by 10 to the power plus 12. So, of the order of you know kilowatt or megawatt kind of a expression will come from the radiation flux. In reheat furnaces, you have cold ingots, you put the cold ingots into the reheat furnace which is maintained at a very high temperature. The reheat furnace temperature is because of either it is there are gases being burned there or there are liquid fuels which are being used. Okay? So, you can you can have for example, some combustion of uh, you can take blast clean blast furnace gas and that blast furnace gas 
which contains carbon monoxide can be combusted with oxygen and that can produce heat. So, the reheating furnace is maintained may be 1200 degree, 1300 degree centigrade into which you put in a cold bloom or a slab then what happens the temperature of the bloom increases. So, between the atmosphere between the furnace and mines and the ingot the heat is being now transferred by all three mechanisms, but that the temperature is very very high furnace temperature is very very high. So, the heat which is being transported to the solid surface is significantly due to the radiation and not via convection or conduction. Similarly, cooling of slabs if you take the slab has slab is hot it has it is coming out the strand is coming out from the continuous casting machine the surface temperature could be about 900 degrees centigrade 1000 degrees centigrade. So, the slab is cooling to the ambient because of loss of heat and that loss from the surface heat is going out to the atmospheric air by all three mechanism, but that the surface is at 900 degree centigrade makes the radiation a predominant mechanism of heat loss. One can really show that as the temperature increases you know the relative contribution of radiation increases and at one point of time you know if the temperature is significantly high then the convection as well as the conduction heat transfer can be neglected and one can work out conveniently. On one case while these expressions if you say that k is not a function of temperature this is a flux is related linearly with temperature, but on the other hand the dependence of flux on temperature brings in non linearity. So, the solution becomes not so straight forward as we will see later on. So, these are linear fluxes. So, t to the power 1 similarly this is t to the power 1 if k is taken to be independent of temperature on the other hand this is temperature raised to the power 4. So, it is non linear flux, flux expressions. So, there are diverse many such cases I mean all the mechanical mechanical working plate mills, hot rolling mills etcetera if you go or cold rolling mills in steel plants there is the play of this you know uh, radiation uh, at very large scale in all these cases. So, it is a very important mechanism for us to study uh, in order to uh, tackle uh, you know certain industrial problem or heat transfer analysis of certain industrial problems. So, this represents uh, basically uh, the rate law of radiation, the rate law of conduction was the Fourier's equation and I said that the rate law in the case of convective heat transfer could be I q convection that is and the q radiation or the radiation heat flux that is to be is equal to sigma. So, there are three rate expressions which have to be used in order to proceed further. So, it is a very important subject for us and energy is money as you all know energy is an expensive item. So, therefore, we will <coughs> got to study radiation uh, in uh, sufficient uh, detail. Now, if you have for example, uh, you take a surface there are of course, uh, you know certain you know you have already studied I think in grade 12 stage the basics of radiation. So, this Stephens Boltzmann's constant as well as uh, you know gray bodies versus uh, uh, black bodies etcetera you must be knowing. So, if you if you consider a thermal radiation falling and then so this is a solid object. And the radiation falls on the surface, the radiation reflects, the radiation is transmitted. And here some absorption takes place of it. And basically, one, one does say that <coughs> alpha represents absorptivity. Rho represents reflectivity and tau represents transmittivity. So, the radiation comes incident radiation E i a part of it is absorbed here. So, alpha into E i becomes 
the amount which is absorbed rho is reflected and <coughs> tau is transmit transmittivity the fraction which is transmitted here. So, this is I would say transmit this is rho reflected this is the transmittivity component and here what we have is alpha okay? and typically this will come out to be So, this is basically what you we have done the amount of absorbed divided by the total amount. So, if you divide the by the fraction then this becomes is equal to 1. So, the amount which is reflected divided by the total that becomes rho the amount which is transmitted divided by the total that becomes is equal to tau and on the right hand side you land up with 1 and that is what is the expression. Okay? Now, most of the material we can treat to be opaque to heat and therefore, this can be taken to be equal to 0. So, we can work out with a limiting expression of alpha plus rho approximately. And this follows uh, mostly because uh, the you know reflection from the surfaces are diffused and not specular. I will explain this. So, for example, if you have a sh shiny surface. and you have a source here. So, you have and then you on the other hand if you have in a hot strip mill you know the plate which is moving and then from the surrounding the its surface then what happens is we say that on the other hand this is a case of a specular And this is diffused. So, most of the time, because this is from a shiny surface, reflection is specular. On the other hand, in this case, the reflection is diffused. And this, when this happens, and this is a real surface, the strip, hot strip. So, as a result of which we can assume that not much material is it is diffused in all the directions. So, the not much material is left to penetrate deep inside the system and under that particular condition for real materials we can consider that transmittivity is equal to 0. Okay? And therefore, this limiting uh, condition uh, applies. Now, let us look at Consider you have a an enclosure, you have an object here, and this is a black enclosure. These expressions that I have written here, okay, these are valid for only black bodies. Okay. So, the moment I have written here that the radiant flux is equal to this epsilon into theta to the power 4. In that case, I put the equal to sign, it essentially implies that this expression is written uh, for black body which absorbs all radiation and emits none as you all know. So, this is a black enclosure here okay, which has a certain temperature suppose uh, you know theta 1. This is just a solid object. I am not saying whether it is black or non black and this is also there is a thermal equilibrium between the two. Now, this all the radiation. So, it is the enclosure is emitting radiation and that radiation is being intercepted by this solid object and because they are in thermal equilibrium it is therefore, understood that there is no net heat exchange. Whatever this object is receiving from this, this must be giving out. Let us see that what is, so as because this is black surface, so I would say 
that as far as <coughs> flux, I'm going to consider it to be is equal to theta 1 to the power 4 e black and this is the one okay this is our surface one and this is two so this is the flux and the net so this is what is the radiant energy so this is going out it is emitting you know which is characteristics for its temperature so that is the radiant energy given out by the enclosure now of this which is incident here, I would say that the total energy which is received by this is going to be actually <coughs> E b multiplied by the area, area is the this area that is what I am talking about okay? and multiplied by the parameter which is alpha because this much energy is incident onto the surface and alpha is the absorptivity. So, of whatever is the given and this alpha is this. So, the, this is the total amount which is absorbed by the body 2. Now, this is giving out energy also which is suppose E represents the radiant energy of this object okay? and then I would say that this is also equal to A and it is giving out. So, therefore, <coughs> it is characteristics and this is we have you know I am not writing what it is is equal to. So, this is a what I am saying E b I all know I know that this is equal to sigma theta s or this is theta 1 and surface 1. So, theta 1 to the power 4 that is what is E b is equal to I do not know what this E is but I know it is proportional to theta 1 to the power 4, let it remain as E. So, this is the total amount of energy which is absorbed by this and this is the total amount of energy which is given out by this. And if you do this now, then you find out that E divided by E B is equal to alpha. And as you know that this is a fraction, from that we understand it is less than equal to 1. Okay? So, therefore, if you know the E b, which we know, E can be found out and E is going to be, E is what? Whatever this is emitting, this object is emitting that is what is capital E and what is this term on the left hand side? The net amount which is received by the spherical object at the center, this E represents E into A represents the net amount which is given out, radiant energy which is given out by the, this is also in what, this is also in what, okay? received and given out. And this essentially tells us that if you know the black body, so if you know from this, you know what is the radiant energy, then from a real body, okay, we will find out that if this is a non-black body, it gets reduced by a factor. So, the, because it is associated with emission we are saying. So, that is why we say that this is an emissivity. So, that is why therefore, we can say that look this A now is whatever is E B. So, whatever it is giving out now that giving out should be E A and that should be is equal to sigma and then I say that this is epsilon and then this is A and then theta s to the power theta 1 that is what it is. So, E into A has become is equal to this parameter and where from this has come because I know the black body radiation energy. So, I should be able to use the sigma into theta 1 to the power 4 and I reduced it by multiplying with a fraction which is E which is maybe 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 0 0.6 depending on what functionality is dictated by that identity and then I multiplied with A. So, therefore, if you know and this I have retained, I have not written the term alpha here, customarily it is written as e, epsilon and that epsilon is called the emissivity.
we understand that emissivity and absorptivity have the same value. Okay? So, this emissivity value therefore, essentially tells that if we at the same temperature a black body will radiate more energy than does you know a real body which is non-black and it is going to be reduced in proportional to the value of epsilon which is called emissivity or surface emissivity and this depends on the characteristics of the surface itself. For example, I may have a very shiny surface on the other hand I may have a steel plate where I may have an oxidized layer. Okay? So, therefore, depending on the characteristics of the surfaces this value of emissivity can be this is the material dependent property this also depends on temperature this also depends on you know whether the surface is very glowing or the surface surface is dull and so on and so forth. But for you it is important to note that this emissivity will change which for steel it is one value for refractories it is another value steel at room temperature could be one value steel at very high temperature could be another value and so on and so forth. But the knowledge of surface emissivity allows us to find out that how much energy a non black body would be given out by simply taking the corresponding black body at that particular temperature and multiplying it with that silent. So, this is so for real object therefore, I can say that the net rate of energy transport net energy which is given out Q is therefore, I would say sigma <coughs> epsilon theta is to the power 4 and this is So, q 1 I would say and this is q 1 and this is as I have written here. So, therefore, this is actually what per meter square. That's all. When you have so, this equation now applies to a non black body also we can also write that if or the net rate q we can say this is equal to sigma epsilon area into theta 1 to the power 4 minus theta a to the power 4. Because the object is giving the ingot is within the furnace the ingot is giving its heat also to the surrounding as it is re receiving. So, this is you know a hot ingot which is maybe cooling in an ambient and this may be the atmospheric temperature. Of course, this term could be negligible. So, this represents the net energy flow from object 1 okay, uh, because I have taken out that whatever it is receiving from the surrounding itself. As such, this rep represents the amount of energy which is per unit area which is going out of the solid object and this represents the net exchange of energy or net energy which is leaving the surface okay, which can be given in terms of this particular expression. Now, when I have talked about this sort of a geometry, we and I and you know I you can see that uh, all the radiation uh, which is given out by the enclosure the incident, it is intercepted by this solid. Okay? But this may not be the case in under all scenarios. For example, you can imagine that I may have uh, a parallel plate like this okay? and you can understand that obviously, the radiations this may be at a temperature of theta 1, this may be temperature of theta 2. So, the radiation which is given out by this okay? and this may be may not be totally intercepted by this, it is only a fraction of the energy which is given out by this will be intercepted by this and vice versa. So, therefore, this kind of a scenario that when this is this applies once only when that there is an implicit assumption here that the object 1 is giving radiation to the surrounding which is intercepted or I would say that the ambient is giving okay, uh, out radiation which is totally intercepted by the solid object itself. 
Okay. The object is radiating as per its you know characteristic temperature, but the part which it is receiving okay, will depend whether all the radiation from the surrounding is uh, intercepted uh, by the object or not. Now, the concept of radiation view factor comes into the picture in this particular certain cases. So, for example, I may have Suppose this I have a regular cube here, okay, all sides are equal and I want to find out that this surface is given at a temperature of theta 1, this surface is given at a temperature of theta 2. The net exchange, if I apply this equation, it is going to be grossly wrong because the simple fact that all the radiations okay, emitted by this is not, you know, there are other walls also, there are, this side walls are there, front and the back walls are there. So, the radiations given by theta 2 is not totally intercepted by theta 1 and so on and so forth. So, therefore, if I try to cal apply straightforward equations like this in order to find out that what is the uh, radi you know, net exchange of energy, uh, that will be grossly erroneous. It is only in this case when the object is completely encircled by the enclosure, okay, we can say that you know they can the, the object can see they can see each other completely, but in this case they may not see each other completely. For example, huh, when the geometries are different in this case. So, this object is being seen by this part also, this wall also, and as a result of which <coughs> we may not uh, you know have this kind of a scenario. So, when you have you know two objects and when the radiation fraction of the energy is uh, you know all the entire energy uh, emitted by one surface is intercepted by the other. So, we say that we denote a parameter called radiation shape factor. I write it with you know suppose this is as I have indicated this is my 1, this is my 2. So, radiation given by 1 intercepted by 2, that is what it implies. The fraction of the radiant energy given out by 1 and intercepted by 2. And in this particular case, the way I have formulated this equation is essentially implied okay, that all the energy has been intercepted by this particular object itself, because this object is completely surrounded. Suppose, if I you know stand in a room, okay, you can imagine yourself to be present in the center of a room. In that case, whatever radiation comes from the wall, everything will fall on you, because you are visible to the entire room. Any from anywhere in the room, you are completely visible, okay? and which may not be the case. So, the in this particular case, the shape factor, radiation shape factor, which is the fraction of energy emitted by surface 1 and intercepted by 1 will be obviously is equal to 1. On the other hand, this may not be true for all scenarios. So, therefore, the in order to apply this radiation equations, we have to know the shape factors. If you want to calculate the radiation exchange between the two objects, we will not be able to do unless and until we know that what are the shape factors, because rarely we will get this kind of a scenario when we have one object, you know, completely can intercept the radiation given by the surrounding object and so on and so forth. So, the calculation or the knowledge of view factor is a must when we will want to calculate uh, the net radiation exchange between the two surfaces. I will introduce a term which is called reciprocity theorem. Uh, maybe I do not have time now. So, tomorrow I will come to the lecture and then I will show you that uh, when you have two objects a 1 into f 1 2 is, is equal to a 2. Simple energy balance consideration. So, that will be our So, what we have done? We have, we have formulated the rate law for a radiation uh, for a black body. Okay. Then we have adapted this to a real life scenario by introducing emissivity. Now, we want to calculate the net heat exchange and we have realized 
that all the radiations may not be given out by one body may be intercepted by the other and we need to talk about the radiation shape factor. So once we have the knowledge of emissivity and once we have the knowledge of the radiation shape factors we will be able to calculate you know energy exchange between two or multiple uh, bodies that I am going to outline in tomorrow's lecture.